do, I wanted to share a couple of names of companies and just by a raise of hands, if you recognize these names, just go ahead and put, put your hand up. Uh, let's start with uh, Endurance, Ultragenics, Helios, okay, Autodesk, Skywalker, Glassdoor, those are a little bit, I saw more hands there. Right, these are some of the larger tech companies that have come out of uh, the North Bay, right? Uh, I'm going to now switch over some some of these CPG brands. And, and please, again, raise the hands if, if, if you've heard. Guayaki, Amy's Kitchen, Yuba Bikes, Camelback, Traditional Medicinals, Crave Jerky. And I see a lot more hands there. And that, that tells me something. Um, as was mentioned, the, the, the North Bay is really special in that it has become a, a real hub. Uh, and it has been for a while. Right of these of these big consumer brands, and these are brands that clearly leave leave an impression on the, on the conscious, and uh, I think maybe hold a, a special place in, in people's hearts in terms of what they what they consume, what they buy, what they hold their hands there, and, and so maybe has a, that special power that that perhaps some of these tech brands don't have. Uh, and and these two folks on stage here, as as you heard from the bio, have been responsible for building, funding, uh, and and growing a lot of, of the brands that you've you've heard of. Um, so with that, I'm, I'm going to turn it over and, and just hear the, the journey. So you've heard the bio, we've heard the companies, you guys, the brands you've started, but I, I want to understand how you got there. And so maybe, John, I'll start with you. Uh, and, and I know you have uh, several things you've done, but would love to hear that, that journey and how you went from you know, a, maybe a founder like what you see here in the crowd to, to where you're at. Sure. So this, it's a long journey, and it's, it's got lots of twists and turns to it. So uh, I'll try to keep it somewhat concise, and then we can go deeper in any area. Um, I'm born and raised in the Sonoma Valley, and I was uh, born into the Sebastiani Wine family. So my great-grandfather, uh, as I call it, he was the original entrepreneur and really had the courage uh, to leave Tuscany, Italy, to make his way to the West Coast, uh, eventually arrived in Sonoma uh, to move the cobblestones to fabricate the first streets of San Francisco. Um, it's a long story there, but the result is he returned to making wine his true love in the late 1800s. So I was raised in this family business around the dinner table, around food and wine and hospitality and, and unity um, and, and in my own family journey, um, as many of you may know, in the sort of Italian background, sometimes families can be your biggest form of competition as well. And things don't always work out as, as you want them to. And, and as a result, uh, in my parents' generation, uh, the wineries were sold. Uh, my branch, when I was uh, graduating from undergrad, I became president of a winery that had just started, which was Vianza Winery. And I helped build that, and we ultimately sold that um, in 2007. Um, that exit, um, it, it's, it was an emotional exit, right? A lot of entrepreneurship is, is in emotion. Um, we're not just looking to flip a trick to make a buck, right? There's something that you're trying to solve. Uh, or fix. It could be a personal problem or you've observed uh, a different problem that, that's unmet. Uh, and in my case, the sale of the winery, uh, which I helped build and sell, I, I then moved to solving an unmet problem for myself, which is I was training to run uh, marathons, Ironmans, and I needed more protein. I was very familiar with food and ingredients and flavor and, and uh, just quality and found that there was not a good meat snack on the market. And you can imagine um, the departure of the, the glamour of the wine industry to then step into the, the gutter of the jerky business, which at that time was like, you know, really just a, a gas station type product. But it was a thesis that I believed in. Um, I totally took a leap into the abyss in terms of was it gonna work? Um, it was two dark years of just giving it everything I had. And, and what I had to lose was perhaps the most important asset, which is my integrity. My, I grew up in a part of a famous wine family. And could I do something on my own? I, I took my career very, very seriously. Um, and this was my moment. And so two years um, it took to really start to see that Crave was, was actually a scalable business. 
it was not only growing itself, but it was growing the category. The concept of incrementality in consumer is a super important, you know, uh, data point. Crave, you know, we, we started it and of course, uh, you know, it, it blossomed quite quickly into a transaction selling to the Hershey company, um, which gave me a platform to return to what I had always wanted to do, which is be an investor. And so Sonoma Brands Capital has been founded on the principles uh, or the thesis that today's entrepreneur doesn't just want to rent capital. They want a true thought partner that's going to help them scale from a marketing standpoint, a distribution standpoint, it could be manufacturing, it could be a lot of different areas where as investors we bring that value to the table. We are big omni-channel investors, so we very much believe in the digitization of, of what we're doing from sourcing customers, from a direct-to-consumer business standpoint. Obviously, there are third-party uh, platforms selling, so we're digital plus traditional um, uh, distribution investors across food, beverage, uh, pet, uh, beauty, uh, personal care, and, and some consumer tech. Can't top that story. <laughs> I'm not an entrepreneur. Um, I'm. I just finished up with uh, 14 years as CEO of Traditional Medicinals, and I have a traditional business background. I grew up in the Midwest, got an accounting degree, became a CPA at Ernst and Young, got an MBA uh, in marketing, went to work at Nestle, became a brand manager, um, and then ha had moved to California in that regard of working for Nestle. Kind of fell in love with the natural foods industry went shopping at this store called the 19th Street Natural Foods Co-op in Santa Monica, California, which still exists today. And I saw all these amazing uh, organic, fair trade, um, healthy products that I'd never heard of before. And I kind of fell in love with them and, and kind of had this epiphany that those companies needed an MBA, CPA, marketing guy much more than Nestle needed another one. And so it took uh, about a 70% pay cut and I left Nestle, uh, US headquarters in Los Angeles and came to Petaluma, California for a veggie burger company, a vegetarian food company called Fantastic Foods. Some of you have been around a long time, might've heard of them. But, and that really set me on a career of really aligning my own personal values and my own personal passion with what I did for a living. And so over the last 14 years, I had the honor of being the CEO of Traditional Medicinals. I came there in its 34th year. It was a great company with great products and a great culture, and uh, it just wasn't very well known. It was, a, it was relatively small. We, we pretty much sold natural foods in natural food stores. And so um, what we did there that was really successful, and, and a lot of it had been going on, a lot of what I did was scaled what was already going on there really well. It wasn't a bad company that I turned around. It was I took something good and maybe made it great, or took something great and, and introduced it to more people. But what we did is we, we had a stakeholder business model where we took into account all the different stakeholders in the business. So usually you're just caring, usually your shareholders are the priority and then everybody else kind of you, you try to take care of a little bit. And as, as the, those of you know what a B corporation is, you actually incorporate yourself so that you're a stakeholder model. And so we made decisions there based on what was best for different stakeholders. And sometimes we did something that was best for a grower in India and wasn't best for our shareholders. And we also could make, we are a private company, so we could make decisions for the long term. And uh, that was a, a really great, uh, a great thing that I had. And, and then uh, we, built a, we built a culture based on, on uh, kindness and purpose and passion. We took all, and we, and we took, we had really high quality products. And we took all of that goodness and we put it into the brand, Traditional Medicinals. And we created a brand. We started doing marketing and doing, uh, a lot of social media and, and, um, and advertising and really getting people to understand that when you bought a box of traditional medicinals tea, there was a lot more tea. There was a really high quality tea and it had a really good uh, business model and it was a really good company. And we were selling tea at twice the price of the average box of tea. So traditional medicinals is two times the average price of, of tea. And for 14 years, we had a 15% compound. We, for, for 14 years, we grew 15 times the category rate of growth for 14 years by having a really high quality product, having a really good brand and, and delivering on that on a regular basis. And, and um, so the, the, these values that we had at Traditional Medicinals, they reflect the values of, of Marin and Sonoma County. Every comp, every, all economic activity happens at the crossroads of quality of life and cost of doing business. 
and Sonoma and Marin County have their own unique spot on, the, on that axis, right? It's not the cheapest place to do business, but it's really high on quality of life. And so us companies, I, I encourage, I think the companies that are really successful in this area are the ones that are right on the right place on that axis. They're high quality products that offer a quality of life for their people. And um, it, it, it's really, that's w w where you're gonna attract the worker that works here. You're gonna attract the person that wants to live here. That, uh, I've moved, I hired 200 people. I was at Traditional Medicines. We had 200 people in the 14 years. Easily 20 of them moved from other states to come to Sonoma County to come work for us. So people will come do that. And I love when you talk about you know values and culture and how that comes through in the product, right? And it's not uh, just the, the company, but it's, it's the region you're in. And so that's something we're going to celebrate. We'll talk more about the North Bay in a bit. But we were sitting in a room, Blair, at lunch with the CPG folks. A lot of people here starting companies uh, for the first time, sometimes multiple, for their second or third time. Um, but I want to hear from the both of you thinking about starting companies. You're both advising and investing in, in brands. How have things changed? What is it like launching a brand in 2022 uh, versus when your brands originally launched or, or, or prior to that? Either of you? Sure, I'll start. So, because I worked at Nestle, the world's largest food company, when I'm on panels like this, sometimes people would ask me, what's the biggest thing you miss about working at Nestle? And there's really only one thing, well, besides Butterfinger, there's only really one thing, <laughs> and we got them for free, as many as we wanted. <laughs> but um, when you launched a product at Nestle, and this was in the 90s, so a little different time, but you, when you had a new product and you launched it, you would you would get into the market, you would have TV advertising, you'd have those those inserts in the Sunday newspaper with coupons, you'd get it into 30,000 grocery stores within six months, and whatever that product was gonna be, it would be within about 18 months. And you can literally be a startup in the natural foods industry and spend 20 years doing the same thing that Nestle can do in 18 months. And, and that was the thing that I really missed, and I think what's what's different today than it is then is is that you can accelerate that distribution now through social media, through online selling, direct to consumer, through the Amazons of the world. You can create a brand much more quickly than you ever could. Uh, listen, we're in traditional medicinals was in seventy thousand retail outlets. That takes about ten years to do, even if you're really good at it. It takes about ten years to get into every CVS, Walmart, Target, all those stores that were in. Uh, that that's a long, long process, and so. Um, through, like we're the, we're the number three tea in the United States. We're the number one tea on Amazon. We're the number one tea on Thrive Market. We leaned into all that really early into the deal because we used to be the 10th largest tea company, not the third. And what, one of the things that really pushed us up the road while we were building all that distribution was doing really well online. So I, I think that's the biggest change is, is it, so why do companies why are successful? They're successful because you have a product that, that meets a consumer need and the consumer buys it and they like it and they have a good experience and they buy it again and they tell their friends to do it. That, that's why businesses are successful. And what, what social media and the internet and e-commerce has done is accelerated that process. It may, it may have taken 20 years to happen, can now happen much more quickly. That's a great point. John, anything to add? Sure, um, I, I think it's, it's a big question, right? And there's a lot of different ways to answer it. Um, I, would, I would agree with Blair and I can touch on, on different pieces of how technology has definitely accelerated uh, the emergence of a startup. I, I would, before I do that, I, I will also say that the availability of capital today is much more accessible than it's ever been. Um, you know, we're in an interesting market right now, um, but we're not seeing it yet. Uh, the values have not deteriorated the private companies at, the, uh, at this point. Um, at the same time, it's never been more in fashion to start a business. So it's extremely crowded uh, with a lot of noise out there. So if, if, you know, and we're, my firm, we're looking at 500 deals a month. We're using AI technology to track not only who we correspond with, but then AI will track their performance uh, digitally through uh, you know, web portals as well as their uh, reported data through Spins or Nielsen. So we're trying to keep up with all the activity. Um, there, there are in consumer, and, and just as an example of, of how the emergence of technology has shifted so dramatically, um, one of my businesses that we happen to be an investor of in is, is called Milk Bar. It's a New York-based uh, uh, Michelin-rated, ranked uh, Baker, Christina Tosi. It's a brick and mortar platform. It's a direct to consumer platform. And it's now a 
grocery platform. And out of COVID has erupted this concept of ghost kitchens. And these ghost kitchens are, are basically dark warehouses that have been converted into com commercial kitchens where you can activate a recipe or a menu nationally uh, overnight. And we're seeing these, um, to Blair's point, these social channels where if you have a partner, if you're a founder with an X factor or you have a community that you've built, how you can so quickly flip a switch and activate your brand overnight. We were looking at a, a YouTuber that has a top five ranking in terms of viewers or, or followers, if you will who flipped a switch on his ghost kitchen and in his first year did 150 million in top line revenue in his first year just from within his community. We activated Milk Bar through the same concept because Christina's got quite a big community from her Netflix shows and so on and so forth. And we're doing you know 20 million year one through this. So that's just one example of how technology has greatly changed. Yeah, so it sounds like pros, cons, naturally. So the acceleration, the ability to scale a lot quicker, the ability to tap into social media to grow a brand, all, all very new things, but naturally the easier it is for other competitors to come in, right? And and, and cost of customer acquisition naturally going high. Blair, do you yeah, want to yeah, add no, that, that, that's I'm always telling our staff, like, hey, as a small company, you know, it's easier than ever. Like as a traditional medicinals, as a $150 million company, we can compete with a billion dollar company easier than ever, but it can go the other way too. You know, so so if, if we if it's easier than ever for us at 150 million to compete with a billion dollar company, it's easier than ever for a 10 million dollar company to compete with us. So you have to play both ends of that, and it's really tricky. So we're we're investors here on stage, and, and like I said, a lot of up and coming brands uh, in, in the audience here, and and just some some advice or maybe kind of what you guys look for uh, when you're getting pitched a brand, and, and we talk about some of these elements. But what is something that they can really take home and, or, or keep in mind as they're out raising money what what are the what are the signs that you guys are looking for that that's saying yeah that that founder has it they have it the, is it the idea is it the i mean we're gonna like i shared previously the the sectors that we invest in so our mandate is that we're going to look at companies that fit into the sectors that we invest in uh, we are um, bound by a mandate that also averages our check size. So our firm, we need to average about a $10 million investment. So that takes us out of the running on the low end as well as, as the high end. So we would be considered a growth capital investor. Um, what we look for at our stage, which is still emerging, right? I mean, these are businesses generally doing somewhere between 10 and 50 million in revenue. We have some outliers. We are we are the first institutional investor in Guayaquil, Yerba Mate, so that's an outlier on the, on the larger side. And occasionally we'll invest in something on the startup side. We call it a toehold position, something that's so attractive that if we don't put our toe into it, we may never get the chance to invest in it again. It's gotta be a big sector, right? It's common sense. You don't want to be the, the biggest uh, business in a $10 million category, right? It's got to be big. It's got to be growing. Uh, the founder has to have magic. There has to be an X factor that sets she or him apart from everybody else. It has to be sustainable. We are, we are now really paying attention to the brand's commitment to the environment and how whatever their ingredients or their packaging, how they treat the, their suppliers in terms of a, if it's a farmed product, how they, if it's international, are they paying fair wages, so on and so forth. So it, that's a component. And then we reverse architect. I mean, the, the, what we do, and the, there's no question that when, if you take capital from a private equity investor, we need our capital back. Um, and usually we have a five to seven year time horizon. So we're investing into you, believing that we're going to at least triple our invested capital in five years. And so there has to be alignment that we're going to exit, and then we have to architect who is going to buy it. So if we invest in a business that's $20 million in revenue, we're going to build models on a five-year you know, sort of time horizon of what this business will look like, uh, usually through you know, skew uh, adjacencies, sort of skew extensions. It could be, you know, advancing a digital strategy that didn't exist or vice versa. Um, so those are some of the components. That's great. And I, I think founders take note, right? Do, do your homework. 
before you come pitch someone like John, know what's what stage they're at, what checks they're they're cutting. You're you're doing kind of growth stage. My fund does early, and do that reverse engineering work for the for us in advance, right? Come say, hey, you're going to sell my company in X years for X hundred million dollars, and here's how much my, my my valuation is now, and here's why it makes sense, and it's reasonable. So the more that the founder can do that for us, all, all the better. Blair, any advice again to? I I, I I think it's a complex, and and John would be the the the, the first to say that it's it's complex though because. Like I love uh, going to work for companies that are creating a new category. It's really hard, but creating a new category it, and it's relatively unknown. I mean, we traditional medicinals created a category called medicinal tea. If you would have talked to people 20 years ago and said, "What's medicinal tea?" they would have said, "I don't know. What is it?" You know, they they it just wasn't something. And now we we've, we've created a category for that. I'm I'm on the board of a seaweed snack company, and seaweed is becoming a that category is becoming the leader in the healthy snack category. I'm on the board of a um, a compostable paper products company. They're the first branded compostable paper products company in the United States. So those things are really exciting, creating categories. But I think you can also come into existing categories like traditional medicinals. In some ways, we were a new category. In some ways, we were just in this thing called tea that everybody kind of knew. So d don't, under don't underestimate your ability to do something better in an existing category as well. That's why I say it's kind of complex. You've got to have um, a, a good quality product that people buy, they want to buy again, and they want to tell their friends all about it. I think that's a, that's a non-starter. You got to be on some kind of a long-term consumer trend. And as John said, it can't be a really solid $5 million idea. That's not going to work for investors either. But, but try, to, try to help yourself answer those questions and be able to come to, a, to an investor with answers to those questions when you start. Yeah, new, new category or certainly reinvent the old ones. We were in the room where there was a yeah, new right. macaroni and cheese and... Yep. Right, uh, and, and new skis that are being invented by some company here. So, um, Blair, you, you talk about the, the, the uniqueness of, of this region. We're here celebrating the North Bay. Would love to kind of get you, both of your thoughts on, on how do we keep this being a hub of, of entrepreneurial activity, particularly in CPG. Um, you know, what can we do both from grassroots, I'd argue MSIV doing the really important work from the bottom up. Perhaps there's top down regulatory things that we can be pushing to help make this and, and keep this a hub for uh, for CPG and young brands. What would you guys suggest on both of those? Sure. So, uh, so in Sonoma County, so I, 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 Sonoma County had an initiative in 2010 called uh, Best: Building Economic Success Together. And at one point, I became the chairman of that. And the biggest thing that I learned about economic this is Sonoma County, not Sonoma and Marin. But the biggest thing that I learned about economic development was that what we learned was about 85% of all economic activity in any area anywhere in the United States comes from existing businesses staying and growing and creating ecosystems for those businesses to thrive. And so what we did at, at best is we, one of the things we did is we determined that the specialty food industry was a really thriving sector in this industry, in, in this area. So we created this, uh, what was called the North Bay Fig, and now we're part of a national organization called Naturally North Bay, which Marin and Sonoma counties are in together. There's another group in the Bay Area called Naturally Bay Area, and it's community. It's a, it's a basically an organized community of all the food companies that are in, the, in each of these regions, and we now meet on a regular basis, and we talk to each other, and we uh, learn from each other, and we our, our motto is that collaboration uh, tr trumps competition, and that together, and then we we can together try to petition for something with the government, or we can petition, hey, maybe we're all buying packaging from the same person. There's eight companies. Maybe we can get them to put a plant up here. And so I think you've got to really get this, this cluster mentality around. You can't, in a county, you can't just do 30 different kinds of businesses. You're going to find clusters of things that do really well. Create an ecosystem. I think Zach is to be commended for what he's, he's got us all here today. He's got this fund going. Um, and I think this idea that we're investing in our, I'm an investor in the, in the fund as well, and a proponent of the fund. And I think that we should all be investing in our own communities and that we can help our own selves thrive and we can help our communities thrive as a result of that. I think Blair really addressed the, the high points. I mean, you know, I, I'm a firm believer in, in the same principles that, that Zach and Blair just mentioned. I mean, I named my firm Sonoma for a reason. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of embedded value I think the origins of our community are, are around hospitality. Um, at Marin and Sonoma both are, are tremendous places to live, as, as Blair touched on. So, you know, groups together. I have a mission to, I mean, I, I, it bugs me that Austin, at least in the food side, has built itself to be such a dominant 
uh, forced to reckon with, where talent moves there looking for opportunities. I mean, this is the, the way that we do it, is pulling the talent together, creating opportunity, reminding us that Amy's, Guayaki, uh, Bashan's, Crave, there's so many, and I'm speaking specifically to food, success stories. And then on top of it, we have this pretty small industry called the wine business that uh, benefits <laughs> us all one way or another as well. We're fortunate to, to live here, and you're fortunate to start brands here. So I think we, we really got to, uh, you know, tap into that. And, and, and I think the community building aspect, as Blair was, was for me, I mean, you have these experts here who build uh, pretty huge businesses, uh, you know, at your disposal. So I, I'd encourage founders certainly to take advantage and, and to celebrate where we are from. On, the, on with that spirit in mind, other lessons learned, perhaps for for those in the room, either entrepreneurs or executives who are who are thinking of. Of leaving their 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 you know high paying job to take a, a third of the salary I don't know Blair any, any anything from your well first uh, of all the, the great thing about the the food industry the natural foods industry you don't have to do that anymore I mean when I when I got in the, when I got into the natural foods industry in 1995 specialty food represented one half of one percent of the American shopping dollar and now it's somewhere around 17 or 18 percent so 36 times larger so but it's funny people in Nestle thought I was clairvoyant I was like I just wanted to work for a company whose food I ate. That was my simple, and, and I wanted to try to change the world through the food, through the products I worked on. But um, I mean, I think there's, a, there's a, I was just, uh, so some of you heard me speak a few minutes ago, but one of the best pieces of advice I, I, I received was somebody told me once that your, your company is like a train running down a track, and the bigger it gets, the faster it goes. And your job as the founder is to make sure there's always track in front of the train and that the track is going in the right direction. And then you got to think about things like every once in a while, you're going to have to build a bridge over a river. Well, that takes 18 months to build that bridge. So if you don't start today in 18 months, your company is going to hit some kind of a wall or go into some kind of a creek. So, you know, the Boy Scouts got it right all those years ago. Be prepared. You really, and then you're talking to someone like John as an investor, you need to be able to lay out, this is what the next couple of years look like. This is what the cash flow looks like. This is my expectations. And don't run up against the wall. Don't run yourself out of money. If you're going to run out of money, know as far in advance as you can that you're going to run out of money. Um, and try to run your companies really well. I worked for a family once that, that their motto was, uh, we try to run our company so well that we never have to sell it. Because we know if we do that, everyone will want to buy it. I thought that was really good advice I got. So, you know, I think it's just, uh, and as founders, you guys and women that are, that are founding these companies, like the company wouldn't exist without you. They can, you can never get fired as the founder of a company. John's going to be the founder of Crave, no matter if it gets sold 10 times or five times. And so you're never going to lose that title, but you're the person who started your company. You're the person that's the reason your company exists. Don't be the person that starts holding back the company from reaching its full potential. You're always going to be the very best founder the company ever had, but maybe somebody else is going to be better at finance. Somebody else is going to be better at marketing. You've got to be willing to hire people that are so smart they actually scare you a little bit. You've got to do that because because what here's the difference between management and leaders. And this is where I see when Blair comes into a company, the biggest thing that I do is I change it from founder owned and founder run to founder owned and executive team run. And the biggest difference between that is it switches from a command and control type operation where one person who owns the majority of the company, who's the CEO, kind of tells everybody what to do to a group of people that are smarter than the CEO, smarter than the founder. But together, the six or seven of them make better decisions than any of them could make individually. And that's the difference between management and leadership is, is being able to. So I, I get calls a lot from people. Like, oh, I want to hire someone like you, Blair. I want to hire someone in my company like you. Like, that's great. And you should. But the, that's the easy part. The hard part is when you're in a meeting and they've got all this years of CPG experience that you don't have. And they're telling you to go right. And you're like, I think we should be going left. That's where kind of the rubber meets the road. And that's. That's where it, it can be really hard. And, and uh, I always tell people that um, making money is no fun. It requires focus, discipline, and repetition. And as founders, you probably want to do new innovation and exciting new ideas and hire those people that can do that focus, discipline, and repetition and get that company going for you. And, um, and, and know that together you're going to be much better than you are individually. And it's, it's, a, it's, that's a, it's an easy thing for me to say, and it's a really hard thing to, to play out. But that's the role that I've played in the companies is really helping 
a group of people make these decisions and a group of people to help the company reach its full potential. That's a, good luck following that, John. That's like <laughs> a, a mic drop of uh, <laughs> advice right there. It's just an advertisement for what yeah, I do for a living. If, if, you're, if you're available to if hire, you have a board seat pitches, available yeah. at your company. Uh, I'm sure his resume. There you go. Um, I, I, um, I, in my portfolio, I've definitely seen what Blair is speaking to. I've I've seen situations where the founder has reached a ceiling where bringing in an executive team is is critical. And I've also seen a founder that brings the magic and the, the X factor that I've talked about that takes it all the way to the end. So it, 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 for me, success from beginning to end is, is sort of a, an Andy Grove quote of only the paranoid survive. And you got to be paranoid every day, no matter what stage of business you're, you're, you know, you're at. Trust this, this, the consumer space is still a relationship industry. It's, it boggles my mind how much the relationship that you've built with a retailer or a broker or a distributor, even your consumer, uh, can oftentimes supersede even your product itself. Of course, having a great product uh, that meets the, the expectations of your customer is, is a requisite, but relationships matter. And this industry in consumer is so collaborative. This is an ecosystem where people share ideas. We do this, I mean, anybody in the room that would like to talk with me or my team, we will, we will take your, your meeting, we'll take it on Zoom or in person. Uh, it's just what we do. And we share ideas, we share visions, we share relationships. You may have a, you know product A that is ready for Costco or ready for Walmart or ready for whatever. Uh, we can be very helpful. You may be looking for a particular employee to, to fit. That's, we, we do that not only as investors, but as stewards of this ecosystem. And it circles back to, you know, really lifting the tide of Sonoma Marin. Uh, it is how we as a community, all of us, uh, all behave with one another. So I would, you know, especially on the earlier side of a business, if you're thinking of becoming a founder, use your relationships. Use Blair, use me. We, we, we will return phone calls. Yeah, I, I think one of the biggest things that I see at all ages is uh, founders or not founders, People don't ask for help and people literally people like John and I are the biggest thing we'd probably say about ourselves is, is we're just grateful. We're grateful for these opportunities we've had in life and we will have the time to help you reach those same opportunities we did. And I, I see more than anything else. People just won't put their hand up and ask for help and help us out there.